In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The prophet Daniel predicted the coming of a king, of whom he declared, Forces from him shall appear, and profane the temple and the fortress, and they shall take away the regular offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. In the time between the Old and the New Testaments, the Greek ruler Alexander the Great added the restored nation of Judea to his list of conquests. From that point on, for the next couple hundred years, the rule of Judea and the surrounding region passed back and forth between the Ptolemy and the Seleucid dynasties. All Greeks considered Jews to be backward, stubborn, and ungovernable. The Jewish religion was considered by Greeks to be a primitive superstition. But the Ptolemies were generally tolerant of their Jewish subjects and their religious practice. But then the rule of Judea and the surrounding region passed to the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV. He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus was a big believer in the superiority of Greek culture over all others, and he wasn't above imposing his beliefs on his subjects by force. In Judea, Antiochus forbade circumcision and Sabbath observance. He also required every Jew once a year in the presence of a government official who would record it, to eat a piece of pork as a sign of good faith. Some went along with the orders and got off. Others resisted and were killed. Things came to a head about 167 or 168 BC, when Antiochus sacrificed a pig on the altar of the Jerusalem temple and poured its broth over, over the sacred vessels. That was the abomination of desolation. It made the temple unusable for Jewish worship. Finally, the Jews rose up under the leadership of the House of Hasmon, also known as the Medes. They revolted against Antiochus and his forces, and over the course of eight days, they cleansed the temple, as you can read in the apocryphal books, of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. That's why our Jewish friends and neighbors celebrate Hanukkah. In today's Gospel, we hear these words of our Lord. So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Lutheran liturgical scholar Fred Lindemann writes, the first meaning is of Antiochus Epiphanes tyrant and king of Syria, when he, what he and his helpers, apostate Jews, did to the temple, as Daniel prophesied, was a picture of what was to happen again at the time of Jerusalem's destruction. In the later language, what our Lord spoke of was the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem. The occupying Romans had long been frustrated by the inability and unwillingness of the Jews to accept occupation and subjugation like a civilized people. Finally, an ambitious Roman general decided the only solution to Rome's ongoing problems governing Judea was to wipe the place off the map and start over. In AD 69, Titus invaded Judea and destroyed Jerusalem and its, and its temple. In the time of Antiochus, the temple was unusable for worship because it was desecrated. 
in the time of Titus, the temple was unusable for worship because, as the New Orleanians say, it ain't there no more. The temple. The temple rebuilt by Zerubbabel to replace Solomon's magnificent temple and renovated and enlarged by Herod the Great was the center of the universe for pious Jews in the first century. And then it was gone. The animal sacrifices conducted in the temple were the means of grace in the Old Testament. But then came the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Our Savior Jesus Christ offered himself on Calvary's cross for the sins of the whole world. So, what's the center of your universe? If it's anything else, just as the temple in Jerusalem, it won't be there no more. But if it's the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, if he's the center of your universe, then it will last for all eternity. Christ goes on to say, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. This is a time of tribulation. You don't need me to tell you that twice. We're enduring an ongoing pandemic. We just come through a contentious election. We live in fear of riots and looting. People are strung tighter than guitar strings. One news reporter commented, we've been living in a pressure cooker. We are in the final month of the present church year. Naturally, our thoughts turn toward the end of the year and the end of all things when our Lord comes again in glory. Lindemann writes, great will be the tribulation also when the final judgment comes, which is prefigured by Jerusalem's destruction. When all the vast fabric of God's creation will have accomplished its end and will fall into pieces in a final crash, even the strongest hearts will quake with fear if they have not sought security in him who has provided a refuge for his people. So, what do we do? Maybe it's time we take a, take a cue from our Jewish friends and neighbors. It's time to cleanse our temples. Jesus says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead, if possible, even the elect astray. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. It's time for us to look into the temples of our bodies and souls and cast out the false gods and false Christs and antichrists that have taken residence there. The problem is, the human heart is an idol factory. No sooner do we knock one down than another one takes its place. So the solution doesn't lie with us. It lies with the one who shed his blood for us. It lies with the one who cleansed the temples of our bodies and souls in the waters of holy baptism. Christ declares, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Our English translations say vultures because what else gathers around a corpse? What else indeed? A better translation of the original Greek is, where the corpse is, there the eagles will gather. Our native bald eagles, by way of example, live almost entirely on fish. But in other places, Australia for example, there are species of eagles who scavenge because that's the only place they can occupy in the food chain. Furthermore, the aforementioned bald eagle is our national symbol, but eagles meant 
something else entirely to first century Jews. The eagle was the national symbol of ancient Rome. Before every Roman legion mar marched a soldier carrying a pole on which was mounted a golden eagle with the letters SPQR, short for Senatus et Populusque Romanum, English translation, the Senate and the people of Rome. Those eagles went before the Roman armies of occupation that marched into Judea. Where the corpse is, the eagles gather indeed. But on this side of our Savior's death and resurrection, we get to look at this in another way. A farmer once found a young eagle chick and took it home to raise with his chickens. One day, a naturalist came along and saw the eagle in his barnyard scratching with the chickens. He asked the farmer, what's that eagle doing there? The farmer said, don't kid yourself, buddy. That's a chicken. The life of a chicken is all he's ever known. So the naturalist took the eagle, perched it on his arm, and held him up, and said, eagle, you're an eagle, not a chicken. You belong to the sky, not the earth. Stretch your wings and fly. Then the eagle looked down at the chickens and went back to scratching with them. The farmer said, see, I told you he was a chicken. So the naturalist took the eagle again, took him to the top of the barn, perched him on his arm and said, eagle, you're an eagle, not a chicken. You belong to the sky, not the earth. Stretch your wings and fly. The eagle looked around at the sky for a minute. Then he looked down at the chickens scratching and jumped down and went back to scratching with them. The farmer said, see, I told you, he may have a 16-foot wingspan, but he's still a chicken. Finally, the naturalist took the eagle to the top of a mountain. He held the eagle up and said, eagle, you're an eagle, not a chicken. You belong to the sky, not the earth. Stretch your wings and fly. The eagle looked into the sun. Then, with a loud screech, he stretched his wings and flew away, never to be seen again. Where the corpse is, the eagles gather. But we're not here gathered to feed on dead flesh. We're here to feast on our risen Savior's living body and blood. And with Christ in us, we become the people we were created to be. In a world where one day the sky will fall, we were meant for so much more than the life of a chicken. We were made to soar like eagles. Lindemann writes, be ready, for the Lord is surely coming. Perhaps very soon the judgment must come. The word of God announces the final judgment of the world. Be ready that when the end comes, you may be safe in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.